Good evening and welcome again to Everything Matters, Tales from the Periodic Table. Tonight we have Tom Belcher and he is, uh, what, tell us the name of your company. Well, I'm a commercial diver and it's called Underwater Resources and we work in the ocean, in the bay, in rivers and any other liquid medium. And you're right, you're our neighbor here. We're right underneath the Bay Bridge overlooking the uh, beautiful bay and uh, we go to work every day wearing a wetsuit or a dry suit uh, underwater. That's great. So you brought us some slides here of, of and t you're going to tell us about the use of helium in diving. We have some of the, well, these great dive helmets up here too. We uh, do everything underwater that can be done in the dry. We end up uh, breathing air or if we're going down deeper we'll, we'll breathe helium with a mixture of oxygen in it and the purpose of the helium is to allow us to go deep, uh, not get narcotic with nitrogen, and to lower the amount of oxygen which becomes toxic. So getting narcotic with nitrogen, maybe Nar explain that? Nitrogen narcosis is a phenomenon that happens under pressure. So you have a, uh, a gas, uh, oxygen on the surface is 21%. When we go down uh, at 79% uh, nitrogen, you get down to about 250 feet in, or even shallower, you'll get drunk on the gas. Wow. You won't be able to reason, you'll make some very stupid decisions. And one of the reasons that we use this type of equipment are helmets with hoses and things is sometimes if you're on air and you're diving deep, uh, you might tend to want to do something silly. So we have a leash on you and we can control you. Now, divers know when this is happening, but it, there's nothing that they can do to prevent it, but... You get used to it. If you end up uh, diving every day to 150 feet on air, your first day you'll get a little loopy. Your second day you're there, pretty soon you're fine and you'll get used to it. It's kind of like getting seasick. You get used to being out in the ocean. So to prevent this, you use, instead of nitrogen and oxygen, which is our atmosphere, 80% nitrogen, 20% oxygen, you we, use a different mixture. We would instead uh, start our dive on air. We'd get down to a certain depth and we'd switch over to a mixture of helium and oxygen. And if we're working at a depth of say 300 feet, it might be 8% or 12% oxygen and the remainder would be helium and we'll be just happy as a lark and when you change over from air to nitrogen or from nitrogen in the air to helium in the helioxygen mix you will become very clear-headed. But something else happens of course. Well you lose your voice uh, that you and I know you become uh, a Donald Duck voice and that'll keep you laughing uh, until someone tries to understand what you're saying. Does, that hinder, it, does it hinder communication with the surface? It, it's terrible if you're not used to it. So you get used to it by listening to it and they've developed uh, radios that unscramble your voice and, and deepen the, the sound and make it a little easier to understand. So we use those as deep as, uh, we work as deep as maybe uh, helium oxygen might be used at uh, 175 feet. We'll use it down to 1,000 feet. Wow. And the deeper you go, the harder it is to understand. So tell us where you've done this diving. Well, we started... A lot of... Yeah, I, I personally started out in 1970 taking scuba. And then I went to a two-year trade school uh, and learned the actual... Uh, rules and the technique and the equipment of diving and then I ended up in the Gulf of Mexico working in the offshore oil platform business and then moved to Scotland and worked in the North Sea. Did that for 300 days a year for three years and decided well I got a little tired of that and I started dreaming of trees and parks and things, dogs barking. So I said well I'll try living on land for a while. And when I moved back to land, we found work in Santa Barbara, and uh, I would work 120 days uh, a year uh, working on the oil platforms, on dams, on uh, coastal structures. But I've worked in India and uh, West Africa and Newfoundland and Alaska. 
It's a great place to travel in the, uh, in the diving business. So tell us what you do. I mean, I know you work on oil platforms and where else? Most of the diving for commercial divers is done working in support of oil construction, oil platform production uh, structures, pipelines, exploration, and uh, it, it, they do that all over the world, uh, offshore oil drilling platforms. So you connect pipelines to the platforms. When they're setting the platforms, you'll, you'll grout the legs, you'll pump concrete, you'll use torches to reduce the amount of steel on a platform so you don't have corrosion. Then you flange up pipelines and you fit them and you're a pipe fitter. You don't need scaffolding. You work alone underwater, typically. You might have a, a partner in a diving bell if you're working deep. But uh, the work you do is you pre-plan and you lay everything out and you are directed and you're talking to people the whole time and you communicate while you're down there. It's very, very natural. I hear there's a little bit of a cleanup diving sometimes that you do too in uh, nuclear reactors and... The nuclear reactor work, the work in sewer outfalls, we work in, oh, the nastiest place in the world. Uh, we'll work in um, a, uh, a salt mine that's been flooded uh, where they're mining borite and uh, if you, it's so dense, the salt water is so uh, heavy instead of wearing 20 pounds of lead, you might wear 200 pounds of lead just to get down because you're so buoyant. So it's sort of like going into the Dead Sea and trying it's to sink. Going into the Dead Sea and sink, you need a lot of lead to get down. Cool. So is, did you want to go through a few of your slides yeah. here? Because I think they're really interesting. Well, I can, uh, I can do a, a quick uh, panel. We've got a series of diving equipment. This is a dry suit. Uh, with a decompression chamber in the background. So a dry suit has like two layers, and you pump air between the inner layer and yeah. the outer layer. Yeah, your, your physical body is, is still at whatever pressure your, the ambient water depth is. All the air does, it gives you a little insulation. You wear wool underneath, and uh, you have a layer of air in there, and that keeps you, keeps you warm, and you're dry. Mm -hmm. uh, you can wear wetsuits also. This is, happens to be a gas diving operation. Those are helium bottles in the back. Wearing coveralls. Uh, the helmet, like this one here, you're breathing gas in here. You have a hose. Uh, it's not as nice as uh, maybe a hot water suit. Uh, the face of a dam up uh, in the High Sierras at Bullard's Bar Dam. And you've all seen some of the older gear, the hard hat uh, diving equipment, and this was the original dry suit with the uh, the harness, the breastplate, coveralls, protective chafing gear, and this is something that you'd wear with a big helmet over your head, and you'd be comfortable this hauling. Is like the, the twenty thousand leagues under the sea kind of thing. Same thing, yeah. same thing. This is a this is a uh, gyration of that same heavy gear hat. Uh, the navy did a lot of this, the Greek sponge divers uh, did some of it. And uh, you could stay comfortable, warm, dry, and have great communications in a big dome on your head. And it might weigh 100 pounds or 150 pounds on your head in the dry, but when you're in the water, it's full of air, you're very comfortable floating around. These are really heavy, I noticed. We were putting these up here, and these weigh like, what, 20, 30 pounds each? Yeah, they weigh uh, enough and you, you get a little sore neck and a shoulder, you're, they're cushioned on the inside. Uh, they often seal with your suit because like in this job uh, pr project that we're on, we're working in a sewer, you don't want any bodily contact. So you're actually totally protected and you might have gloves that are sealed at your wrists and you have no bodily contact with whatever you're diving in. That'd be preferable in a sewer. In a sewer, it's preferable. Well, here's. Uh, here's a helmet, a uh, video camera on a helmet. And here we are getting in a sewer or coming out of a sewer down in Monterey after the Loma Prieta earthquake. It's covered with foam. Well, yeah, foam is present in sewers. And uh, oh. as is grease that floats to the top of the pipe. 
Here we have a 28-inch 28, 28 uh, vertical standpipe going down to a sewer, and we were working out about 2,500 feet inside of the sewer pipe that was broken. And we were putting seals in the pipe. So I assume that divers with claustrophobia kind of wash out really early. The first thing you want to find out, you don't want to invest into a training program or equipment that's expensive. Otherwise, you just have to put it up for sale on uh, eBay. Mm -hmm. So we work in the bay, we work on uh, dams, uh, we work on uh, shoreline structures, we work on sewer pipes. Ships. Ships. Yeah. Uh, here's the Bay Bridge. This is a sewer pipe next to the Bay Bridge, which uh, we'll be going to work on pretty soon. And uh, you see the hose that connects to the diver's helmet to the surface. You have communications, you're always talking to the person. You also have another hose in there as a backup. The diver wears a bottle on his back for emergency air in case his, his uh, breathing supply gets pinched. Uh, here so we that's are. actually a big difference is the, what we're used to thinking about diving, you have, a, you have a set of tanks on your back, but this is all surface fed air. Surface supplied diving as opposed to scuba diving. Uh, two different modes of diving. They, they get you down to the same place, but the difference between scuba, self contain underwater breathing apparatus and surface supplied, which is what we have here, is you're pretty on your own with scuba. You run out of air, well, it's too bad. You better be near the surface. You have to come up and change bottles, get another bottle, and no one really knows where you are uh, unless you have a line. On surface supplied gear, you're gonna be, uh, have a leash and they're gonna be able to find you. You're gonna be able to get back and you can communicate and you have virtually unlimited air or gas, whatever you're diving. Sometimes you drive, uh, dive in tandem. Uh, there'll be two people down there required to put a gate in, but most of the time it's, it's one. So as we move into the gas realm, this is the box that controls the manifold. Uh, you'll have heli helium oxygen on one side coming into a manifold and that'll be sent out to the diver. You'll also have air. You can mix the two together, you can have a treatment mix, and treatment is something you do in the water and out of the water for uh, prevention of the bends. And the bends is a problem that you have when you come up a little too quickly. We actually have a demo of that. I brought, uh, today I went to the store and I bought a bottle of, uh, of fizzy water. So I think we should make it have the bends. We should release the pressure on it really quickly. What's going to happen? Well, we'll, let, we'll see what happens here. Ooh, look at all those bubbles that just came out of the fizzy water. So this would be your blood, and if you come up too quickly... The dissolved you get gas in your blood. Dissolved gas in your blood will expand. It'll stop at your joints, cause pain, and that's the bends. And to get rid of it, you have to put the cap back on and go down deeper, and you shrink the bubble. And Let's then you see. come up a little slower. If I put the cap on, can I squeeze enough to, to cause the bubbles to stop? Let's see. Let me just knock them off there. Yeah. Voila. I can stop them from, ha from going. If I let go, well, nope. It already, it is actually compressed gas up there still. It's sealed, though. Once it's you sealed, open it up yeah. again. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So that's what goes on in your blood and your tissues as you come up too quickly. If you need some, we have some fizzy water here for okay. you. Okay. <laughs> so we just continue. Uh, this is a decompression chamber. You do some of your decompression for either air or gas diving in the water. And they have tables that the Navy developed. Uh, the Navy actually developed gas deep water diving uh, in 1939 and they, they salvaged the Squalus submarine and they were working in 250 feet of water. And they used a recirculator hat, that helmet that weighed over 100 pounds and a cast of hundreds, I'm sure, to, to do all this. And then this evolved in the Navy field until 1963 in Santa Barbara. Uh, the abalone divers got together and said, well, we know how to dive. We can dive deep. We're just going to change. We're going to put a scuba regulator inside of one of these helmets like this. 
and we're going to breathe gas. And they did the first gas dive to 400 plus feet in 1963 in Santa Barbara. And that was the advent of the commercial diving, gas diving industry in the world. And I worked for the guy that did the dive when wow. I got out of school. He so it hasn't been around that long then? Not really. I mean, it's been around and uh, diving's been around for centuries, but gas diving is relatively new. So you go from uh, shallow surface decompression after you do a little in-water decompression, you go in this chamber and they, they bring you up slowly and they watch the gauges and the depths, then you come up and you're fine. You drink your coffee, you go on deck, and uh, then you go to a different type of diving. This is a mode of diving called saturation diving. And that's when you have a lot of work at a deep depth for a long period of time. And there might be six of you living in, in, a, in a habitat, and this is your protector. This guy is watching your gauges, cleaning your, your uh, carbon dioxide, scrubbing that clean, making up oxygen that you're breathing. He's also sending in food, flushing your toilet, sending in sheets, magazines. Okay, so these divers are living in a habitat. They live in a habitat on, on board. They live actually on the deck of the, of, the, uh, of the surface of the water on a barge. Uh, this is not a saturation, but this would be maybe a gas diving barge or a surface air barge. And divers using these helmets would go down, do their work, come up, do some decompression in that first chamber you saw. So you can come up and then they put you in the decompression chamber and bring you back down again? They bring you back down. So you, you say you dive to 150 feet, you do increment decompression on the way up in the water, and then you're at 40 feet and they go, okay, we're gonna give you five minutes to get to the surface, into the decompression chamber, and back down to 40, 40 feet. Or this is what will happen if you, if you take any longer time than that. You're gonna have fizzle going on. So these are habitats now that uh, living habitats on board a barge. This is in the North Sea. And there's three on the bottom with a little small transfer habitat on the lower part. And then on the left, on the upper part, you have a bounce system, which is also a diving bell that would fit on either, either system. But that diving bell, you lower over the side, it would be pressurized. You could be at 400 feet deep in that diving bell on the surface and everyone around of you, around you is just eating a sandwich okay, so walking let me, by. Let me get that straight. So you're working 400 feet under the, under the water. They lower this thing down into the water. It's pressurized to 400 feet so you can get into it. Yeah. Seal it up, bring it back up to the surface. So it's still at high pressure at the surface. They connect it to this habitat and you live in there until the next time you need to go down and dive and do your, the next day's work. That's right. So in this instance, if you look at the three habitats that are joined together in that small dome on the lower port, part of the picture, the, the, there'll be six people living and they're working in teams of two. So those cylinders are six foot by eight foot and you're living in them a month and the diving bell might be four and a half foot round, so there's two of you in there, and it always did me well being short and small uh, to be a diver, as opposed to the guy that could bench press 400 pounds that was six foot six. He had a problem sleeping in those habitats. I had no problem. And so, <laughs> so since you're at pressure all the time, when you get in that diving bell, they can just rocket you down. They rocket you down. Um, but not the first time. The, the first time you might go down there, you'll be at one atmosphere, oh, which okay. is where we are right now. They'll put you, because it has double doors. So either, the, either keep the ocean pressure out or keep the high pressure in. So you have one that opens up, one that opens down. So when you first do your initial dive, you might go in the diving bell and you'll be just like in this room, breathing air. You'll go down to 400 feet and you'll position the barge and the crane to get you right where they want you because it might be, time is important here. Uh, then they'll pressure yourself up. 
and you will go from zero surface down to 400 feet in a matter of minutes. Wow. And you're blowing your nose and getting your eardrums equalized. And oddly, if you do it that way, it's not a, a great way to do it. Your, your joints will lose all the fluid out of it and your joints will squeak. It's not a very smart thing. So once you make that initial mistake of doing it once, you never do it again. But you take your time. Now you take your time, and what they usually do is they blow you down in a chamber, you're already equalized, and then you go down in the bell, you've, you've already uh, been saturated. And saturation is a term, it's tissue saturation of a gas at a certain pressure. And once you reach saturation uh, pressure, time and, and, and uh, uh, pressure, there's a equilibrium you can stay there forever and you'll have the same amount of decompression coming back up to the surface. So the saturation diving is so the divers can be adapted to the depth and not have to worry about doing all that adaptation coming up and down. Coming up and down, I imagine, is kind of strenuous on... Not good for the body, probably, uh -huh. and the bones and the joints. And uh, it's bit, so we'll stay there for 30 days. We'll live, eat, work, go to take the diving bell to work, uh, teams of two, Three teams, you'll, you'll probably dive every, every uh, 24 hours, you'll make a dive or every 36 hours. And then you're off reading the magazine. And then at the end of the day, at four or 500 foot deep, you might have a decompression time of about four or five days. And that'll get you up to the surface. They'll bring two out at a time. The other two are still working. They stagger you. And after about 15 days, they've cycled everybody through. So it's and then you work on the deck for a month, and then you come back out there and do it again. I hope this pays well. It pays well, <laughs> and, and that's the allure. Certainly as a young man, that's what you want. <laughs> but uh, just a few, these are the banks of helium gas that we would uh, breathe on, the left -hand side on the left hand side. And they have technicians. So we might have for six guys in saturation, there'd be a team of 24, two teams, two shifts of 12. And the divers are on 24-hour type shifts. They're on their own schedule. But the remainder, the other 18 people, nine per shift, will be working at keeping you at depth, maybe doing some surface diving, mixing your gas, feeding you, and making you comfortable. This is another type of system, a diving bell that you go down, and a smaller system designed for 1,000 feet. And these systems, a thousand Actually, feet. A thousand feet. And there's not many oceans or there are not many drill rigs that work in that depth of water, but that's... Except that, for James Cameron. James Cameron, yeah. a little deeper maybe. Um, in theory, you can work down to 1,600 feet. Wow. And they tested people, but it's difficult to breathe helium. Uh, that's another, another one of your programs, so maybe going or one of your previous programs, breathing hydrogen. But wow. different gases... Uh, Helium is easier to breathe. Nitrogen, you can't even, you couldn't breathe it. You couldn't mechanically compress it because it's too dense. So it looks like you're working on a boat wreck here. This is a barge in the bay. Uh, one of our salvage jobs of getting the barge up on the, on the surface. And I've got a, just a few other shots, application shots of what we do. Here's a pipeline repair up in Humboldt County and we, we, the pipeline floated off the bottom, it was buried, so we had to re-anchor it to the bottom. And we're getting ready to go in and use these anchors in the foreground that we jackhammer down and put straps over the pipe, and that's how we secure the pipe to the seabed. Here's another pipeline that's a water conveyance pipe that we built, and we pump it full of water and we control its submergence. Um, You've seen corrugated metal pipe that are corroded and we slip line corrugated metal pipe with other pipes and we grout the annular space. This is at a uh, sewage wastewater treatment plant. And I think that's my well, thank slides. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Give a hand to Tom. Thank you. Tom Belcher.